Welcome to week two of Where's Jesus? This is a series where we are learning how to read and study scripture the way that Jesus taught his disciples to read and study scripture. There's this amazing chapter, Luke 24, the very last chapter in Luke's gospel. I would encourage you to go study it this week. It's in the time frame where Jesus has already gone to the cross on Friday and then on Sunday defeats sin and death once and for all. But Luke 24 is kind of this awkward moment where Jesus is back, but a lot of people don't know that he's back. And so uh, these two people, these two guys are walking on the road to Emmaus and they go, you remember that Jesus guy? Like I thought he was gonna be the Messiah. I thought he was going to be the one. And then Jesus just appears to him and goes, hey, what are you guys talking about? Because I think Jesus was a lot funnier than we give him credit for, you know? And, And now there are a lot of moments, people always ask me if you could be at one moment in the Bible, what moment would you pick? I've got a lot of choices, but oftentimes I feel like that conversation on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24 would be the one that I would pick because in Luke 24 and verse 27, it says that Jesus, starting with Moses and then going through all of the prophets, basically all of the Old Testament, goes through and shows us how all of it points to Jesus. And then Jesus goes to this back room where the 11 disciples are hanging out They're down to 11, Judas is is gone. And they're at this moment where they're just like, what, I feel like the movement has come to an end. And Jesus goes, oh, no, 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 What the world calls an end, we call God just getting started. And we pick up the story in Luke 24, verse 44. Jesus says this to them. This is what I told you while I was still with you. I love Jesus. He's like, "I, I told you this so many times. Everything, everyone say everything. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about who? About Jesus. In the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. In other words, the the entire law points to Jesus, all of the Psalms point to Jesus, and all the prophets point to Jesus. And then it says this, then he opened up their minds so they could understand the scriptures. By the way, that's a fantastic prayer. I pray it all the time. Jesus, would you open up my mind to understand these scriptures? So, so last week, Ethan talked all about how the whole law points to Jesus. And it was by far the most entertaining and best sermon I've ever heard about the law. Go listen to it if you weren't here. Next week, we're talking about how all the prophets point to Jesus. My task this week is to look at the Psalms and to show us how all of the Psalms point to Jesus. I love how the message version says uh, this. It says, then he, Jesus, said, everything I told you while I was with you comes to this. All the things written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms have to be fulfilled. And then it said, he went on to open their understanding of the word of God, showing them how to read their Bibles this way. That's what we wanna do in this series. We wanna show you how to read your Bibles this way. Because Jesus is kind of like uh, Danny Ocean at, at the end of Ocean's 12. You guys remember, you guys seen Ocean, Ocean's 12? At the end of it, it's George Clooney's character. At the end of it, he like sits down in a room and basically explains how he's been the one like pulling the strings the entire time and he's been in control the entire way. And if I just ruined Ocean's 12 for you, it came out in 2004. I can't help you there. What I'm trying to say is Jesus is kind of like George Clooney, you know? He's like George Clooney at the end of Ocean's 12. He was in control the entire time. It all points to him. You remember the book, Where's Waldo? As a kid, am I dating myself right now? Anybody remember books? <laughs> when I was a kid, on road trips, my parents would give me a, a Where's Waldo book and it would be lots of different people, like, like this room right now, and then Waldo would be somewhere and I would just have to search until I, I found him. The Bible is kind of like a game of Where's Jesus? <laughs> lots of characters on lots of different pages and yet Jesus is all throughout the Bible. And so we're gonna play a game of where's Jesus today in the Psalms. We ready? Think we're gonna find him? Promise you we will. 
All right, the Psalms. Right in the middle of your Bible is 150 songs. It's over 7% of your Bible. These 150 Psalms are the songs that the Israelites would have grown up singing. So these are the songs that Jesus would have grown up singing. I love uh, Tim Keller. My favorite devotional on the Psalms is by a guy named Tim Keller. It's a year-long devotional that I uh, would highly recommend, but he calls it the Songs of Jesus. I love that thought. Like, these are the songs that Jesus grew up singing, so we should probably learn them as well. By the way, music has been a part of what we do since the very beginning, because music has a special power to move us, doesn't it? The very first review we got online of our church, somebody said, like the church, could do without all the singing. And we said, well, take it up with God, because this is how it's gone from the very beginning. Music has a, a way of moving us, doesn't it? That's why, like, when I was a kid, I, uh, I always struggled in history class to remember dates. I'd be like, July 4th, 17 something, something. But then, like, I knew every lyric of every Blink-182 song that had ever been written. You know? Music has a way of moving us. And so when you go to read the Psalms, I want you to remember that these are songs. And, and songs aren't just there to inspire us. They're there to take it a step deeper. They're not just there to inform, they're there to transform our lives. It's like Psalm 139. This is David speaking here. David says this, search me God and know my heart, test me. I almost started singing that. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> test me and I'm not gonna do it. And know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You could just read that and let it inform you. Or you could slow down and realize that this is a song that is meant to transform that we have been singing for thousands of years. So on Friday morning, I woke up feeling really anxious. First thought, alarm clock goes off. I go, oh no, this sermon's terrible. <laughs> First thought, I go, nobody's gonna like this. It's too long. I can't explain the Psalms in 30 minutes. Nobody's gonna come back for week three of Where's Jesus? The church isn't gonna make it. Why am I a pastor? I should have got into real estate, you know? <laughs> and then I stop myself and I'm like, good Lord. Like it's literally 30 seconds into the day. Yeah, is that, am I the only one that, that happens to? Is that, all right. Like at least let me like get out of bed first, you know? So I, I start to panic. I go, I gotta get to the church. I gotta, I gotta run this sermon a couple of times. I gotta workshop this sermon a couple of times. I probably gotta call Doug and tell him to fix the whole sermon for me, you know? So I, I get in my car and I'm driving fast. I'm all stressed out. Get to the church. I make my coffee. I go upstairs and I'm like pacing back and forth, rehearsing this sermon. And I'm like, hey, there's 150 psalms and music moves us in a special way. Blink-182 joke, then read Psalm 139 and then just like move right on to the next thing. I feel like God stopped me. He goes, hey, bud, how about you start practicing what you're gonna be preaching? I go, oh, yeah. So I sit down with Psalm 139. I go, search me, God. Like, search my heart. What are my anxious thoughts? What's going on? I start taking a few deep breaths and I ask the spirit to search my heart and I go, well, I guess I'm stressed out because I feel like I have to show people how 150 Psalms all point to Jesus in 30 minutes. And I felt like God was like, and? I go, well, I care deeply about this message. It's transformed my life and so I putting a lot of pressure on myself because I, I really want to make sure I communicate it in a good way. I feel like God's like, and? And I guess I'm doing that thing again where I still feel like I'm the one that has to do the heavy lifting. God and I have this, this phrase when I start to get anxious about a sermon or whatever, I go, the word of God's going to do the heavy lifting. The spirit of God's going to do the transformation. I'm just gonna hang out. I have that moment where I go, well, God, I can just hang out. Like, yeah, yeah, you can just hang out. By the way, 
feel like God goes, hey, and where is Jesus in this? Because that's a great question to ask on every page of the Bible. It's also a great question to ask in every stage of your life, every day of your life. Oh, I guess Jesus was saying, I don't have to worry about anything. Just seek first the kingdom and all these things are, are gonna be taken care of. And Jesus is coming back one day, not as a baby in a manger, but as the king of kings and as the Lord of lords. And on that day, all of my stress and all of my worry is gonna look really silly. You feel that? The Psalms have the ability not just to inform, but to transform. If we'll allow ourselves to slow down long enough to let the word of God sink into our heart and become a part of who we are. Let's try this. Right here, right now. We live in a world that is vying for our attention all the time. So as you sit in this chair or as you watch this online, I wanna invite you right, right now, would you just close your eyes? Unless you're driving, watching this later. <laughs> or on a treadmill. I, can anybody close their eyes on a treadmill? Some people can. As soon as I close my eyes on the treadmill, I just panic. Don't close your eyes if you're doing that. Close your eyes, take a moment, and ask God to search your heart. Anxious thoughts. Do you have any of them? Some of you are away from your, your kids for the first time in a long time as you sit in this room. Some of you, this is the, the first time that your phone's not blowing up all week. Some of you have a, a big business meeting this week that you're nervous about. Some of you have a, a business trip. Some of you need to find a job and it's weighing on you. Some of you, maybe for you, you feel really lonely, feel isolated, and you're worried that that's just going to continue or you keep chasing after a dream and it keeps failing. You feel like this dream in your, in your heart, you feel anxious that it's not gonna happen. Or maybe you accomplished your dream and it didn't fulfill you the way that you thought it did and now you're worried that maybe you were playing the, the wrong game the whole time. What is it? Just give it a name. Something powerful to just naming it. And then give it some space. Allow yourself to feel it. And then just say, would you lead me, God, in the way everlasting? Give it to God. Just let it go. That's what happens when we let the Psalms not just inform, but transform our lives. Now, there are 150 Psalms and lots of different authors of these Psalms. Let's talk about who wrote these different Psalms. So David comes in first place by far. David was a, a warrior, a fighter, but he also played the harp and wrote poetry, right? He really played, he, he, he was the best of, of both worlds here. He wrote 73 of the 150 Psalms. We're gonna talk about three of them today. A guy named Asaph wrote 12 of the Psalms. Asaph was David's worship leader, the Emily of the crew. David would always be doing these, those festivals where we need music to praise God. Asaph would be the guy, but he, would, he also went on to write 12 uh, of the Psalms. The sons of Korah were a traveling family band that wrote 11 of the Psalms. That's a joke. But it does sound like it, doesn't it? Maybe they were. We don't know much about the sons of Korah, mostly because there were four different Korahs in the Old Testament. Um, lots of scholars that I read this week believe this is referring to the Korah from number 16. There's a very interesting story about uh, Korah number 16. He was a contemporary of Moses and Aaron. So back in the law, the stuff that Ethan was talking about last week. And Korah worked at the tabernacle, basically like working at the church back in the day. But the job that he had, he felt like it was beneath him. And so he started to get frustrated. But instead of finding a healthy outlet for that frustration, he sat on it and he let it become anger. And then instead of healing that anger, he let it turn into a grudge. And then instead of working through that grudge, he let it turn into bitterness. Day after day, bitterness took root in his heart. And then one morning he woke up and looked around and thought, you know, I could do this better than Moses and Aaron. This is a tale as old as time. 
the original church split. Cora goes, oh, well, I'm gonna raise up a group of people and we're gonna go do things this way. Which I love, by the way, because they're wandering in the wilderness. So it's like, you know what, Moses? I don't like how you wander in the wilderness. We're gonna go wander this way. Bitterness makes us do some pretty illogical things sometimes, doesn't it? You can go read the story in number 16 this week. Uh, spoiler, it ends very poorly for Korah and the church split. And I think there's a teaching here that, that bitterness never leads to good fruit. I think it's important that, that we talk about this because here's the thing. There is going to come a, a time in your life where you feel like God is calling you to do something new. Like the old thing's not working anymore. We need to go do something new. We need to change it up. When that moment comes for you, I want you to remember two things. And both of these things are equally important, okay? The first is this. That's a good thing. Like we serve a God who says, I'm doing a new thing. We serve a God who's always ready to bring some new wine to some new wineskins. Absolutely. Number two is this. When you move forward with bitterness, you end up trying to carry so much baggage with you that you're just of no use. That's why when bitterness is the root, it rarely bears fruit, which is a rhyme I just came up with now, Nicole, but it worked. Hey, don't carry the, the, the bitterness from your last relationship into your new relationship. Don't carry your bitterness from your last job into your new job. Don't carry your bitterness. Please don't carry your bitterness from your last church into your new church. You end up being so weighed down that you're gonna find yourself just being exhausted all the time. Hey, life's too short. Life's too short and bitterness is too heavy. Blessing seems to be allergic to bitterness. Take some time to heal and then step into the new thing that God has for you. That's not what we're talking about at all today. <laughs> I'm just trying to answer the question. <laughs> I'm talking about the sons of Korah. <laughs> okay, so, so, okay, Korah uh, didn't do things the right way, and it ended very poorly for Korah. What's interesting, though, if this is the Korah from the sons of Korah, it seems like his kids broke the generational curse and said, hey, my, our dad may have gone that way, but we're gonna go this way. Our dad may have wanted to build his kingdom, we're gonna build God's kingdom, and they end up singing and playing and writing a bunch of the songs. A guy named Solomon wrote too. He also wrote an entire book called The Song of Solomon, Song of Songs. I'm not married, so I don't understand any of it, but I'll let Doug and Ethan explain it some other time. <laughs> Moses wrote one. Ethan talked about Moses last week. He was more of a law guy, you know, but he got creative once. Haman wrote one, and then this is my favorite thing. What a gift from God. Ethan wrote one of the Psalms. Psalm 89 was written by Ethan, and you guys said he doesn't bring anything to the table. He wrote a psalm. Did you guys name Ethan after Psalm 89? That's some, Ethan's parents are here today, guys, the best. Hey, let me just say this. We, I love you guys so much. Uh, you guys hear us talk about um, how Justin and Andy have been mentors of all three of us for years. Uh, we would not be doing what we're doing today now uh, without your guys' influence in our life. We love you guys. Thank you guys. And then 49 are anonymous. Most of them, if we're being real, were probably David, but we don't know that for sure, so we say anonymous. All right, so David wins. Not that it's a competition. Oh, we, I just immediately am turning this into a competition. David wrote a lot of Psalms. Let's talk about three of them. The first one is Psalm 23. Uh, this is the most famous Psalm that David wrote. He started his life as a shepherd. Um, long before the palace, he spent a lot of time in the pasture. And there's a teaching there for another day. I'm getting so, so sidetracked today, but we're gonna make it. We got this. Psalm 23, he wrote this. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Okay, if you leave here with nothing else today, I want you to leave with Psalm 23, one in your heart. The Lord is your shepherd. You lack nothing. You believe that. 
thousand years later, Jesus put some good language to this for us. John 10, 10, we love to, to quote it. He said this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief, the enemy comes to try to convince us to live from lack. The enemy tries to convince us that we are lacking things. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. We love John 10, 10. We rarely read the next verse. Get this. I am the good shepherd. Hey, you know how David's been singing for years about how the Lord is our shepherd? It's me. Talking about me. I am the good shepherd who came to lay down his life for his sheep so that you don't have to live a a life of lack, but you can have a life of abundance. John 10, 10, and 11 makes makes sense and, and shine a light on Psalm 23, 1. So I'll ask you again, do you know that the Lord is your shepherd so you don't have to lack anything? Like seriously, ask yourself that question right now. Like, let's, let's, let's start easy. When somebody else experiences something good, is your reaction to celebrate or is your reaction to go, well, what about me? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Okay, so when your coworker gets a promotion, are you high-fiving them and taking them out to lunch? Or are you like, When's my time gonna come? The Lord is your shepherd. You lack nothing. For those of you who desire to be in a relationship, when your friend gets into a relationship, is your reaction to celebrate and be genuinely excited for them? Or is it, what about me? When's my time? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack. Let's take this a step deeper. When something bad happens to somebody else, don't respond audibly right now. (laughs) Because we would never say this out loud. But let's just be real about those, those deep places in our heart that we're asking God to search today. When something bad happens to somebody else, is there a part of you that celebrates it? Because when we live a life of lack, we start to feel like God is grading us on a curve, which means that them falling is actually to our benefit because we're gonna move up in the ranks. It's living from lack. Hey, celebrity gossip is a $3 billion industry. Why? Because as a collective whole, as a culture, we are living from lack. We don't realize that the Lord is our shepherd and so I don't have to lack anything. We don't realize that we are good just the way that we are and be confident in who God created us to be and so instead it's easier for us to to throw stones at other people and gossip about how other people are doing bad because maybe if they're doing bad, then I'm doing better than I thought. Scarcity mentality, living a life of lack. And we, we have to talk about this because this is just as bad, if not worse, than the church. We make documentaries, podcasts about people falling and we eat it up. I get more questions about that stuff these days than I get about the Bible. Like, what are we doing? And people always say, yeah, I know, isn't it so bad that they made that? No, I get that completely. It's called supply and demand. For as long as there is a demand for gossip in the church, there will be more than enough people happy to supply it. The only way forward is Psalm 23.1. The only way forward is us realizing that the Lord is our shepherd so we don't actually lack anything. I don't need them to fall so I can feel better about myself because I already have a seat at the table. You guys, this is so important. This is so important. When we start to understand Psalm 23, one, what starts to happen is we, we, we see those things or we hear those stories 
and we respond just with love and compassion and an ability to look inwardly to our own hearts and go, oh, I see the same propensity in, in me. I should work on that. I should get some help for that. I should talk to somebody about that. I should let God heal that part of my heart. There's an entire story in John 8 of a, a girl who did something wrong and then a bunch of guys standing around with stones about to throw them at her. Jesus gets in between. What does he do? He turns it on them. There's any, anybody without sin? And slowly, one by one, they just go, oh yeah, I'm just an imperfect person pursuing a perfect God too. What am I doing? Why do I need her to, to fail so I can feel like I win? And we love that story. We read it and we cheer Jesus on. We come to church and we say amen. And then we pick up our stones, I mean our phones, and we keep throwing. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Gotta get it. All right, Psalm 51, let's keep moving. Later on in David's life, he becomes king, and uh, he lives a, a pretty good life, a man after God's own heart, but then he has a really bad day, a really bad couple of weeks. If you know the story, it's in 2 Samuel 11. All of his, his boys go off to war, and he stays back. Uh, and... And he sees a woman named Bathsheba. The story is rated R, by the way. Uh, sees a, a woman named Bathsheba who is the wife of his friend Uriah. Uriah is off at war. He ends up uh, having an affair with her. And then she gets pregnant. He tries to cover it up by having Uriah come back from war. They have some drinks together. And he goes, hey, you should go, you should go be with your wife. Uriah just sets up his mat on the middle of the road and he goes, no, my, my boys aren't at home yet. They're still at war. I'm not going home either. You can do nothing but just love this Uriah guy. So that doesn't work. So David starts trying to cover it up a little more. This is how sin works, doesn't it? You tell one lie, you have to tell another one and then another one and another one. So he sends a message to have Uriah put at the front lines of the battle where it's going to be the worst. And then when the, when the battle heats up, everybody else is supposed to, to pull back and leave Uriah there by himself. Even a gifted warrior like Uriah isn't going to be able to stand, and sure enough, he gets killed. You remember last week, Ethan read the 10 commandments to us? David, the king, the man after God's own heart, commits adultery, commits murder, covets his neighbor's wife, and lies about it. He, he, he blows it four times in like a very short sequence. So why do we call David a man after God's own heart? The answer is Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the, the psalm that David wrote when he was at his lowest moment. Right after this event took place, David sat down and he wrote one of the realest, honest, most vulnerable psalms maybe that, that we have. We're not gonna read the, the whole thing um, for time's sake, but, but let's take a look at Psalm 51.1. David says this, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. This is a thousand years before Jesus. Listen to his language, blot out my transgressions. Go to verse nine. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Who does that sound like? Somehow David just knew. David knew that Jesus was coming. I don't know how. I'll ask him one day. But this reminds me of Colossians 2. Ben, you guys can come up. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. That's all of us. Imperfect people pursuing a perfect God. Then God... Say, then God. 
made you alive with Christ for he forgave all your sins. Get this, he canceled the record of the charges against us, David, and took it away. How? By nailing it to the cross. I love how the King James Version says it. Blotting out, Psalm 51. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Four years ago, Wednesday, I got my car and I drove out to Austin to help plant this church. And I was so excited along the way that I started to speed. Confession. I got pulled over. And a cop knocked on the window and explained that this was a construction zone, so this ticket's gonna be a lot. And he's asking me what, I have all of my possessions in my car, you know, so he's, he's asking me what's going on and he's writing this out. And then he goes, you know what? We're good. I was like, what? What do you mean? He goes, we're good. Go ahead. He doesn't give me the ticket, which at the time I could not afford, so I was so relieved. I was trying to play it cool, but I was so nervous. So I get in my car and I drive to Austin to help plant this church. Now, what if that next day I had gone into, into the courtroom and said, hey, uh, I'm, I'm here to pay my ticket. They would go, okay, well, what was your name? And I would tell them and they would look it up and they, they would go, uh, we don't have a ticket for your name. And I would say, yeah, I, I know the cop took care of it, but here's the thing, like, like I was speeding and so I, I, would like to, I would like to make this right. They would look at me like, what are you, what are you talking about? I'd go, I, I'll split it with you. Let's go halvesies. <laughs> Eventually, like the person would look at me and say, hey, stop paying, stop trying to pay for a ticket that's already been paid for. Now, how, how often in church do we find ourselves trying to pay for a ticket that Jesus already took care of? How often in your life do you try to, to perform for Jesus and, and, and serve enough and help enough and disciple uh, enough to hopefully blot out for those sins from the week? The message since the beginning was there is somebody coming who is going to blot out our sins once and for all. David somehow knew about it even in his darkest moment. Now, if you're here and you're going, okay, cool, Ryan, I still don't believe you. Psalm 22, one. Psalm 22, one is all, all, all you need to hear. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound familiar? It's the very thing that Jesus said in Matthew 27 as he hung on a cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was Jesus doing? He was quoting Psalm 22. Because in those days when you said the first line of a psalm, everybody around you knew, oh, it's time to sing the entire thing. It's kind of like happy birthday. I have such a terrible voice. So I just sing the first line of happy birthday, then I step away because everybody joins in. This is what Jesus was doing as he hung on a cross. Everyone's like, is, is the movement coming to an end? Jesus goes, Psalm 22. What does that Psalm say? Let's read it. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Jesus completely surrendered and yet entirely in control, even from the cross. He's going, no, I knew this was gonna happen. This is for you. Keep going. They pierce, they pierce my hands and my feet. Roman soldier puts a nail through his hands. Yeah, I knew you were gonna do that. This is for you. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. Get this. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. 
literally exactly what happened at the cross a thousand years before. Jesus is calling his shot. He's going, hey, the entire Bible points to this moment. The entire Bible is a love story to you because God knew that you would never be enough to do it on your own, so you would need a savior to come and help. And from the, from the garden, man, from the very beginning, God knew you and he said, hey, I love you so much that I'm gonna make a way for you to have a relationship with me forever. Where is Jesus? Fulfilling the entirety of the Bible. We could do this all day. The takeaway is this. Don't you dare sit in this room and think that you are better at sinning than God is at saving. The whole thing is about God's masterpiece of a story of how much he loves you. And don't you dare believe that he's not going to finish the good work that he started in your life. Where's Jesus picking you right back up, saying, I'm with you, I love you, I believe in you, so let's go. So you guys stand to your feet with me. That is the God that we worship today. Jesus is our champion. And so together as one, as we lift a, a voice and, and, and cheer on and worship our champion, would you just be encouraged that all throughout the Psalms, all throughout all of scripture is this reminder after reminder after reminder that God loves you. So Father God, we thank you for this love story that you have been writing from the beginning. Even the Psalms point to you, Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hey, with everybody's eyes closed, I wanna just give, I feel like I need to give a chance to respond right now. So two questions. The, the first question is this, if you're hearing this maybe for the first time and you're going, it's time. It's time, I'm ready to declare that this story is about me. I'm ready to lay down my life to stop building my kingdom and I wanna start building God's kingdom. Would you throw your hand up in the air? I wanna pray a prayer with you. Amen, just say, Jesus, I believe that you are Lord and Savior. I make you the Lord of my life. Would you forgive me for my sins? The second question is this, as we've been talking about all of this stuff, if there are some spaces in your heart that you feel like you need to let go of and repent of, maybe it's some gossip in your heart or some, some bitterness in your heart or just a grudge that you've been holding in, in your heart, would you just lift up your, your hands in the air? There's something powerful that, that happens when we respond to God. I wanna pray over you, Father, you see every hand. Jesus, you see every hand. Right now in the name of Jesus, I ask, Holy Spirit, would you come? Spirit, would you remind, would you speak identity over every hand in the air, sonship, daughtership, made in the image of God. As we worship you today, would that bitterness melt away? As we fix our eyes on you, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, our champion, Jesus, amen.